Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today on the podcast, we're going to tackle the topic of social contagion, and we really want to build this out and talk about it in all of its forms. What we're essentially going to be discussing is influence, our ability to influence each other and to be influenced. And it's an important human capacity to be able to connect with one another in this way. It can be tremendously positive. It's an important part of establishing relationships with one another. It's an important part of the analytic process. But our ability to be influenced can also have very negative, damaging aspects as well. Jung talked about psychic epidemics, and we will be discussing his formulation. So with that, we're going to launch in and circumambulate this notion of influence in all of its many, many guises. When we think about Jung's idea that we're all connected to a universal field, and we imagine things can be communicated in that field, one of the examples which has always surprised me is how influenced I and we as a culture are by fashion. <laughs> I, I can remember so many times, I don't know, opening up a magazine and seeing some kind of a fashion style and thinking, oh, that looks terrible. I would never wear that. And lo and behold, about two years later, not only am I wearing it, but I think it's attractive. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm thinking, how, how did I get so rewired? Yeah. And also, it's not harmful. I mean, whether or not your shorts are down below your knees or they're, you know, up much higher. But there's all of this like social influence about what seems both normal and what seems attractive mm -hmm. and how pliable that all is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember leisure suits? Yes. Ooh. I was young, but I owned one. <laughs> Polyester leisure suits. Because oh you could wash goodness. them, put them on a hanger and wear them the next day. <laughs> I remember shortly after I moved to Philadelphia, I bought this certain kind of black leather jacket and didn't really think about why I was buying it. And it was sometime later that I realized that I had sort of bought the Philadelphia black leather jacket. I had never had any desire for such an article of clothing when I lived in New York, but I had been uh, influenced to buy sort of the Philly uniform at that time. And, and things like tattoos and piercings, you know, this will really date me, but th those were, uh, th tattoos were absolutely verboten back in my day. Uh, only sailors had tattoos, heaven forfend. Um, and now, of course, they're, they're everywhere, especially in the summer season. And piercings. I remember piercings becoming kind of noticeable as things were coming also out of England, this kind of punk rock um, aesthetic, and just being 
shocked, shocked by all these images. And now seeing some, you know, lovely high school kid with a nose ring seems elegant. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, it's just amazing and crazy. But it does speak to our ability to be influenced. All kinds of things can be influenced. Economists know this well. The economy is a place where this shows up all the time. I mean, really famously, there was the tulip craze in, I believe it was in the 1700s. In Holland? In Holland, yes, where uh, different kinds of tulips uh, became tremendously valuable People were scrambling to get uh, tulips of certain colors and and certain color combinations, and they were getting more and more and more expensive until uh, this bubble popped, mm-hmm. and and then tulips went back to being kind of you know the same the same value that they'd always been, and people who had invested all this money in these tulips were left high and dry. And today we have Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, that are sprouting like wildfire. And also, of course, advertisers know very, very well how to influence us. When you were talking about the tulips, I was thinking about this non-fungible token, NFT craze. It's a thing. Um, People are producing these small pieces of digital art. Some of them are just GIFs or even memes. And you can buy the original meme. People are trading them and some of them are selling for a million dollars. And and these are not necessarily great works of art. They're images that have just caught a collective value. It's hooked something and all of a sudden, something that nobody was paying attention to takes on a fairly numinous quality. And I think this presses us into the general realm that something has to fuel a a social contagion. And from a purely Jungian lens, that would be a kind of incarnating pressure from an archetype. Yeah, Jung talked about uh, psychic epidemics being fueled by the spontaneous activity of an archetype. So the really sobering example that Jung wrote extensively about trying very hard to make sense of it was the wars with Germany and Jung's intuition that the archetype of Wotan had been activated in the collective psyche. Wotan was a wind god who was also a god of war. And uh, Jung had visions of this dreams intimating it, and uh, for the rest of his life, it seemed, he continued to cycle back, wanting to comment, feeling there was a mystery in how could people who you loved suddenly flip into this fervor, or how could neighbors that have lived next to each other for decades suddenly turn themselves into enemy informants? That it was, it was a compelling mystery to Jung because he saw the damage that it could create and wondered how could we not let that happen again. Mm-hmm. He talks about these crazes, as it were. He says they alter our view of the world. And we can think about that. With, we were talking about fashion before. We're, we're, you know, we, our, our, our whole sensibility changes. They alter our view of the world and like a contagion infect our fellow men. And if you could imagine all three of us wearing Daisy Dukes back in the day, you can understand the horror and of that affliction. I, I'm thinking about the kinds of archetypes uh, that we might name that have been present uh, in some of the economic crazes, whether it's tulips in Holland or, or Bitcoin or non-fungible tokens. What is it about fashion what gets activated? Um, I could imagine owning and greed and the desire to accumulate wealth and to have something unique as undergirding uh, some of these economic crises. Perhaps the archetype of beauty undergirding uh, fashions. 
and the promise that acquiring something, whether it's a piece of clothing, a piece of jewelry, a particular kind of car, will bestow a quality that seems to be invested in it. And of course, that's the great allure. A car is designed in a way and then is marketed as a tremendously sexy, powerful, um, unstoppable. And once the psyche invests that depth of feeling into it, we feel that if we were to purchase it, we would then possess those qualities. And boy, that we are all so vulnerable to that. So what we're talking about here, I think, uh, is status of having the right kind of car or the right kind of anything, and also the archetype of belonging. That if I have um, a Philadelphia black leather jacket, I belong to some unnameable tribe uh, of fashionistas. But also just remembering, you know, kids coming home and just thinking that if they don't get a certain sneaker, that it's just the end of the world and they'll just be ostracized. And the true kind of distraught concern that, you know, some nine-year-old brings in, they're they're in a sincere crisis. And there's some legitimacy, too, to some of that. I, I will say that one of the things I sincerely regret with my kids, we were, had a limited budget, was um, getting them clothes at Sears instead of Levi's. And if I had it to do over, I would have succumbed to the brand name. <laughs> I remember that walk of shame to elementary school wearing my Sears Huskies. Uh, oh, oh no. yes. <laughs> I, had to, I shopped in the Husky section. <laughs> Boy, that is a confession. <laughs> that was a hard market to, to, to reach. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, just how how natural imitation is. Yes. And it is an important human characteristic. And it has been uh, critical, I think, to the development and the survival of the species. It's, it's how we learn language. Mm-hmm. It's how we learn music. Uh, humans uh, are the only animals to imitate the sounds directly of other animals other than birds, which obviously can do that quite remarkably. And really only humans can truly imitate an, uh, the course of action of another. So you think about our just innate ability and drive even to imitate. And I think that this speaks to the issue of belonging that you were both just talking about. Mm-hmm. But it, But it's even probably just a very basic unconscious instinct to imitate. This is how ideas spread. This is how innovations proliferate. And and so it's something just very intrinsic to being human, I think. We have mirror neurons, you know. Uh, I can't remember who, but fairly recently discovered mirror neurons. And um, it's nice to have a neurological label to put on an innate human behavior. I uh, just recently was with an eight-month-old baby. You can really see it, of course, and I saw it anew with making facial expressions and smiling and and watching him imitate with his mirror neurons. I think so much a part of, of our human connectivity. So there's a way in which we observe each other and out of uh, a desire to be warm, connected, safe, part of the tribe, we look at each other. But there's also another um, collective, well, we could call it a psychic contagion, which is just instincts themselves. That we are born, our bodies are born with certain instincts that we don't really get to choose out of. Jung also surmised that instincts seem to be rising out of a collective psychological field. We now tend to want to describe that as a form of biology, but even then it's very mysterious. You know, we ascribe or evolutionary psychologists will prescribe certain survival values to certain instincts and that we just all got them by natural selection. But Jung would say at a certain point, these patterns like fight or flight 
are actually psychic structures. And it's through that level that all of us receive an inheritance of antibodies, I suppose, right? Uh, of kind of responses to stimuli. Mm -hmm. That's such a nice way to put it. You know, I'm going back to, Deb, your description of the mirror neurons. And, and it's true that we do just sort of get in sync with one another. You know, people that are getting along will unconsciously mirror each other's uh, body language, for instance, or facial expressions. And Jung talked about this a great deal and the necessity for this in the analytic relationship that we, we must be able to be infected by our patients that we're not really going to be able to do any deep work until we have that kind of resonance. You know, one of his famous quotes is the meeting of two personalities is like the contact of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed and, and that the doctor must take on the illness of the patient. He talks about that quite a bit. So we, we must be kind of psychically open to one another to really establish a deep connection. And I think what Jung's advocating there is the difference between a kind of psycho-spiritual vulnerability, which suggests that the process is being observed and there's a conscious participation in it versus an unconscious influence, which is more of an infection in the same way that we really don't invite uh, a flu virus, a flu, flu bug into ourselves. We just discover it's kind of rummaging around in our bodies. So Jung was very interested in the possibility that we could at the very least monitor this. And that would give us some degree of choice around it. Well, I, I want to push back up on that a little bit, Joseph, because I think that when we find ourselves getting infected it really isn't available to consciousness that, that I can't make a conscious choice about why one person affects me deeply in the consulting room and another person less so. Hopefully I'm observing it and I'm aware that it's happening. And my intention is to be open to it to an extent, but of course I'm human and sometimes that kind of infection doesn't quite happen between me and another person. And sometimes it happens so strongly that I almost lose my footing. So I do think it's not entirely amenable to conscious manipulation, if you will. But I like your term, observe it, you know, which always... Um feels to me now that football season has started, like the ability to be up in the skybox as well as down in the field, of to notice uh, that I'm very much affected by this person and what he or she is feeling and saying and how we are together, and less affected by, by someone else, whether it's a family member, a friend, a colleague, or someone in the consulting room. But it is possible to have that kind of binocular vision. I think it's vision, but I also think there is a certain amount of choice if we just keep it in the analytic example. For instance, if we notice that a client is having an effect on us, we have a choice to mull that over privately to do what we would call as an internal interpretation or to be able to verbalize it and interpret it in the room, which often, but not always, stops it dead in its tracks. So there is a kind of decision we have as to whether or not we're going to notice and let the process flow and we're just going to be curious versus coming in and trying to break the spell. So I suspect, just as you said, Lisa, we don't have total control. We have some choices, some, some dials that we can turn. Mm -hmm. I want to move this discussion more into uh, another sense of this and, and that is how influence and social contagion interacts with mental health. Yeah. 
So let's go back and look at a really old example of this. And then uh, we're going to pick up with some newer ones as well. But one of my favorites is the glass delusion, which was the most widespread uh, mental affliction in the Middle Ages. And it got its start with Charles VI of France. And uh, he would have these spells where he uh, felt he would sit motionless And if he did move, he did it very, very carefully. And when he was asked about it, he explained that he was made of glass and would shatter with one wrong move. And it it eventually spread from him. I mean, you know, a royal disease, you know, kind of gains the certain cachet. And it gained in popularity. It it got more and more popular until about the 1600s. and, And it turned into a, a real cultural phenomenon. It was written about um, by Miguel de Cervantes. Uh, Rene Descartes mentioned it. Uh, it was noted in, in books at the time. And it mostly spread to the upper classes. And then, and then it just stopped. Now, there are very, very rare cases of something similar, but it's uh, just sort of like, astoundingly rare. But this this was how people understood a way to be ill during this time period that we were talking about. And that lifts up, you know, uh, what you were saying, Joseph, about the activation of an archetype, that there was something symbolic about this particular mental, we would call it a mental health uh, problem today, uh, that ca- that represented something in the culture, so it caught on. Uh, probably, if this king had had some other kind of uh, delusion, uh, such as that his feet were too sore to walk on, I'm just making this up. You know, that might have just been an idiosyncratic thing that was unique to him, and and it didn't catch on. But something about this caught on because it represented something that was ubiquitous in the culture and came to symbolize a a certain kind of activation. Well, and I I think that that's a great point, Deb, and I think it's always really important to wonder about what is being communicated with these symptoms, because I think something always is, and here's how I understand this, is that the unconscious looks for a way to communicate. And when we're in some kind of psychic distress the unconscious is looking for a way to clothe that distress in an idiom that speaks to the time and has clout, has believability. So there's a a sociologist named Edward Shorter, who's written a bunch of books about the history of mental disease. And he came up with this notion of the symptom pool and how mental illness appears in a culture at a given time is a matter of what symptoms are in the symptom pool at that time that have cultural currency. So if I went to a psychiatrist and I said, I'm made of glass, or I went to my, let's say I go to my doctor and I say, I'm hoping you can help me. I'm made of glass. He's going to say, right, (laughs) you know, let's, let's get you over to psychiatry right away. Whereas if I, if I went in and I, if I developed symptoms of uh, an eating disorder, I would be taken seriously because eating disorders are uh, a, a known affliction that we, we believe in their seriousness. We take them seriously. We don't discount them. That's in the symptom pool now. In the Middle Ages, the glass delusion was in the symptom pool. And it really does change. So the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, uh, what's the full name of it? (laughs) It's the Bible of mental health. It's got all the diagnoses in it. And it notes uh, the existence of what they call culture-bound syndromes. And they they list a whole bunch like um, running amok in Singapore and Malaysia, 
running amok, um, men in particular kind of just go crazy and get really angry and they maybe even kill someone and they, they're just kind of out of their minds. But this is like a recognizable syndrome that happens to mostly men. And there's a whole bunch of others. They're fascinating. One, one has to do with, um, I wish I could remember the name of this one, believing that your genitals, your, for, again, for men, that your genitals are um, kind of disappearing up into your body. That's another example of a culture-bound syndrome. I think that most mental health disorders in one way or another can be considered a culture-bound syndrome in that the culture influences how a distress gets expressed. Not that the distress isn't real, but how it gets expressed is mediated in part by societal expectations and social influence. I'm still back with thinking about this epidemic of men feeling that their genitals are getting sucked back <laughs> up into their bodies. And I'm just like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's infected me. It's like I'm oh, totally possessed by this horrible <laughs> idea now. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, geez. <laughs> Keep me up tonight. <laughs> so, I, I think what I'm left with, with all those, you know, very sobering and sometimes funny examples is how vulnerable humanity is. And of course, we've seen examples of this all the time. I think right now this, all of this feeling of getting vaccinated or not seems to have taken on a psychological life of its own, yeah, secondary definitely. to any scientific information, but it seems to have possessed various groups and formed into a kind of subculture identity. And then we know that we're in this world of psychic infection where an idea feelings and images are just flowing through an aquifer that everybody seems to be sipping from. And some people have a tremendous sensitivity to whatever that mm -hmm. molecule is. And it's um, populating them That's in really ways that well are played. really interesting and mm -hmm. concerning, but mm -hmm. interesting. We could hypothesize what the underlying you know, kind of symbols, belief systems, et cetera, might be around people that don't want to get vaccinated of independence and their individual choice and uh, belief about not having to wear masks and be coerced in certain ways uh, by the medical community, let's say, uh, so that it's it's about more than just uh, vaccination. It takes on a much bigger meaning, much the same as the glass delusion did. It represented something that was underlying as a way of channeling or canalizing distress back in the Middle Ages. And what is, what is it? It's the same thing is happening now. You know, I want to say, though, that I think we have to be really careful that we don't talk about this as if we're not being influenced because I think we all are being influenced all the time. And when you're, you're holding fast to your beliefs, you think, Oh, well, this is just, you know, this is, this is right. Or this is truth or something. And Oh, those people over there are being influenced. <laughs> but yeah. the scary thing is we are too, no matter yeah. what belief you hold, you're in the midst of influence. I think that speaks to our vulnerability for sure. But coming back to what Deb was saying, part of the medicine around this is to try to brush against the archetype that is pressing yes. through the infection. And this goes to Jung's idea of archetypal healing. That, for instance, let's say it's the archetype of freedom. I haven't given this as much thought as I'd like, but let's just say that it is. Whether or not I wear a mask, whether or not I get a vaccination or perhaps other decisions as well, that the archetype of total liberation, the archetype of being free of limits, free of any influence, outside influence other than the ego itself, is, is a kind of archetype. And human beings long for freedom, all kinds of freedoms. 
So it's not that we don't all long for that, but when the archetype of freedom gets activated and it begins to accrete a certain modern belief system around it, it imbues the belief system with a kind of religious uh, vibration, which right. Jung called the numinosum or numinosity. So all of a sudden, you know, not wearing the mask is a heroically numinous mm -hmm. feeling to it, secondary to any of the other thinking around it. And once the archetype gets activated, as we were saying, we're all twice as vulnerable as we might have been when it was just a concept, an abstract idea. So I think to pick up on your point, Lisa, which is so well taken, you know, that it's the question of the fishes in the water and takes the water for granted. Uh, and or, so we were the brine we're pickled in, as one of my friends will say, <laughs> oh, which is boy. even better. <laughs> uh, and we can add to that that uh, for Jung and many other branches of psychology, uh, it is also imperative that we do our best to differentiate from the cultural and familial societal uh, waters we swim in to be able to see that so that we're not just, we're not only influenced uh, at least we have some observational capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some reflective, some reflective capacity. Some reflective capacity, and I have to put in a pitch here for just check the facts and check the data that there are external sources uh, that are available on all kinds of questions. Yeah, I, I sometimes I think that that's easier said than done because you can find such conflicting information out there. Amid influence, how do we find truth? And I think it's um, a worthwhile endeavor, and I recognize that it's complicated. I want to just sort of lift up what, what we've all been talking about, about the dangers of this. And with this uh, important quote from Jung, this is from Collected Works 15, paragraph 339. He says, It is becoming ever more obvious that it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself who is man's greatest danger to man for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic epidemics, which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural catastrophes. The supreme danger which threatens individuals as well as whole nations is a psychic danger. And that is sobering. Well, then it also speaks to his entire concept of fighting for one's liberation or individuation, that to outline the problem in even dramatic terms so that some of us might be spurred to notice the way in which we've become sheeple and <laughs> can at least begin to imagine what it might be like to be less so. But as you were saying, will we ever ascend totally out of that influence? Probably not as long as we have physical bodies because physical mm -hmm. bodies exist in that instinctive link and that's not yeah. going to change. But, but I wanted to just cycle back for one second because we've talked about psychic infection. We don't even know it's happening or once it's happened, we may not be able to change it. One of the things, ways that we can at least become suspicious that we're involved in a psychic infection is that we have a disproportionate amount of emotion and feeling about it. Oh, that's great. But that's yeah. always the hot button. Mm -hmm. And this comes from Jung's early research about where are people complexed? So he reads these lists of words, and some words people just give a very fast answer that makes perfect sense. But then just a word was enough to kind of lock them up, or they'd laugh, or they couldn't think of what it even meant, that they would have a disproportionate emotional response to something. So this goes to all of us, that when we look at these collective movements, at least, if I have a disproportionate amount of feeling for whether or I wear a mask or not, or frankly, whether somebody else wears a mask or not. And it seems like I am like red hot about this topic that immediately should push the, the alarm button. Like there is something disproportionately intense about 
what I do or what other people do about this. And that can often be the trigger to get us digging down more. Well, and I want to say too, I think that when it becomes a question of personal identity, that's another clue that we might be in something. I'm wondering if I can pick up on another historical example. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that would be hysteria. So hysteria was always sort of a kind of wastebasket diagnosis. And then Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, who worked in Paris at the Salpetriere, uh, started working with women who had hysterical symptoms. The symptoms were, were vague and varied, and there's sort of any unusual presentation that was otherwise unexplainable could be, you know, described as hysteria. And Charcot felt that there was a, a sort of a biological reason for this, and he was he was going to find it. And so there he was toward the end of the 19th century, and he became a bit of a medical celebrity. He started these Tuesday lectures that at first were just attended by fellow professionals, but they soon began to attract uh, considerable numbers of people, including some of the intellectual lights of Paris. And he would bring these young women on stage. He would select these patients randomly, and then he would sort of thrill the audience by kind of finding signs that would confirm the diagnosis and kind of under his influence, these young patients, they were often teen girls would act out these kind of bizarre symptoms. And then he would, he could sort of magically cure them too, all, all through suggestion. And then it spread hysteria spread through Europe and it was very, very common and in fact, this, these are the patients that Freud was first treating and that Jung was first treating. And then 20 years after Charcot's death, one could not find a single case of hysteria in any of the Paris hospitals. That's uh, William Stakel noted that. So once it spread under his influence, and then it kind of died away. And so we would think of, of this, again, as a kind of social contagion. Psychiatry is filled with these. Why? Because most psychiatric symptoms cannot be objectively verified. They are either behavioral or they are by patient report. So if I go to the doctor with a sore throat, the doctor can do a strep test and say, you have this bug that's making you feel this way. But if I feel depressed, even it's just per patient report, there's no blood test for depression. And I'm not, I'm not saying that depression isn't real, but I'm saying that we, we work in this realm where there's a subjective quality to everything we do. And so it's rife for these kinds of um, socially mediated experiences. Yeah, I think that brings up a really powerful question that Jung couldn't have anticipated, that we are being groomed to be increasingly sensitive to these social signals. And this grooming is a lot to do with kind of dopamine and these algorithms that are being used. But yeah, I think you're right, that we are much more vulnerable than we have ever been at any other time to being pulled and yanked and to have our values and aesthetics very quickly influenced. And I'm going to fold in here uh, another Jungian concept that Jung considered one of the five basic instincts, which is the religious instinct of how important it is to believe. And belief can be attached with religious fervor to all kinds of things, uh, from the glass delusion that you mentioned earlier, Lisa, uh, to all kinds of things today. There are all kinds of groups, cults, organizations. Um, the list goes on and on. Politics. And the economics. members, right? And the members are 
as you said, Joseph, disproportionately emotional about what they believe in. And I will say, you know, something like the Flat Earth Society. Right. Uh, they are passionate about how and why and that the Earth is flat. It's worth looking at stepping back from, you know, what are the things we take for granted and um, whether we are being sort of groomed to be receptive and influenced by all the things that are out there, the publications that we read, the all of the social media platforms that are out there. And it's very intentional and very possible in, in our age of social media to put out all kinds of things as true or necessary or important and to tap into these archetypal factors that we're all influenced by whether it's the need to belong or the need to get rich or the need to be individuals and to you know, do what we feel is uh, important for our freedom. You, you know, um, Joseph, you, you hinted at something that I think is really key, which is how things have changed in our modern era and how we're more susceptible than ever. And I, I want to take a minute and summarize a very recent paper that just came out. It came out in, oh gosh, I don't have the journal in front of me right now, but it's freely available online and we'll put it in the show notes. It's called Stop That. It's not Tourette's, but a new type of mass sociogenic illness. And I believe that the authors are German and working at a German clinic that specializes in Tourette's and they propose a, a new term mass social media induced illness. And in their paper, they talk about a young YouTuber, 20 year old named Jan Zimmerman, who started a YouTube channel, the I'm not even going to attempt the German, the (laughs) uh, English translation is thunderstorm in the brain is the name of his YouTube channel. And Apparently, he does suffer from a mild form of Tourette's syndrome. However, on his channel, he also engages in all kinds of movements and vocalizations and activities and bizarre behaviors that uh, the team says are clearly functional in nature. I'm sort of uh, paraphrasing from the paper, so I just want to make sure that they're credited The YouTube channel got immediately popular right away. It reached 1 million subscribers in less than three months. And today, Zimmerman is the second most successful YouTube creator in Germany, with enormous popularity among teenagers in particular. And there there even, there's merch with the most popular exclamations on uh, shirts and hats. And there's also a mobile app that includes the most popular popular vocal tics. Then these people who work with Tourette's patients are finding months after the launch of the channel, started having all of these teenagers show up claiming they had Tourette's or even coming in with diagnoses uh, of Tourette's. So, and, and disturbingly, many, many of these young people had, had achieved a diagnosis of Tourette's and had received uh, medication for it, including antipsychotics. So these are young people that, as you will hear in a minute, do not have Tourette syndrome, who are receiving really powerful medication for something they don't even have. I'm just going to read this out because it's, um, it's fascinating. This is why the researchers know that it's not actual Tourette's, but is what they call uh, Tourette-like or um, functional movement disorder. So they say, firstly, all patients presented with nearly identical movements and vocalizations that not only resemble Jan Zimmerman's symptoms, but partly are exactly the same, such as shouting the German words, fries, bomb, Heil Hitler, you are ugly, and flying sharks. (laughs) 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 <laughs> as well as bizarre and complex behaviors such as throwing pens at school and dishes at home and crushing eggs in the kitchen. 
Even more, similar to Jan Zimmerman, words and phrases are pronounced with changed voice in low pitch so that family members are able to differentiate normal conversation from supposedly verbal tics solely based on the tone of voice. Secondly, a substantial number of patients gave their supposed Tourette syndrome a name, just as Jan Zimmerman does. He calls his symptoms (laughs) Gisela. (laughs) Thirdly, patients often reported to be unable to perform unpleasant tasks because of their symptoms, resulting in release from obligations at school and home, while symptoms temporarily completely remit while conducting favorite activities. Hmm. Finally, in some patients, a rapid and complete remission occurred after exclusion of the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome. I have to tell you, just the thought of roaming through my life and occasionally shouting flying sharks (laughs) is so perversely appealing to me on a certain level. It just seems like it would be an outrageous good time. I I think you should start doing that in your sessions, Joseph. Flying sharks. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, what's appealing to me is uh, that I'm going to be having such symptoms every time I have to do the laundry or do the dishes. I think. Or um, go somewhere, see people you don't want to see. (laughs) Just start throwing eggs around the room. Uh, Flying sharks. Flying sharks. (laughs) Everyone backs away. It's too um, irresistible, you know, not to see the humor in it. And yet, uh, it does point out and point how incredibly influenceable we are. And on multiple levels, when people are in the grip of a complex, or whether it's a social contagion or something personal, that these forces have control of your body. So it's not just like you have a, a an odd idea, but it it lays its hands on your nervous system and all of a sudden you're having feelings or your heart's racing, your GI tract is upset or your muscles are cramping that these, uh, these forces are um, serious and there's something to contend with. Even if the topic is silly. I want to share uh, something else that the authors write. They say this can be viewed as a 21st century expression of a culture culture-bound stress reaction of our postmodern society emphasizing the uniqueness of individuals and valuing their alleged exceptionality, thus promoting attention-seeking behaviors and aggregating the permanent identity crisis of modern man. So it, it, they're getting into these larger issues about identity and about our sense of self and about our our need to be seen as different, about our need to be cared for. And underlying all of this, I think, is our relationship with a sense of meaning in our lives. That taking on this contagion, which is entirely unconscious. I don't believe that most people presenting with these kinds of symptoms are choosing to do so consciously. But it it really is an infection, not a choice. But it seems to answer some needs. Flying sharks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what what I am wondering about from uh, the glass delusion, which I seem to be fixated on, you know, to the flat earth people, to this um, quasi, you know, Tourette's type uh, stuff, is whether despite all of our media, TVs, platforms, et cetera, whether we are really uh, isolated in some deep way from one another Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and need to be able to claim attention and need to be able to claim the need for care from our friend King Charles, you know, all the way to these teens in Germany. Uh, and all around the world. It's uh, happening all around the world. There's also a big TikTok community for Tourette's mm-hmm. and, and for multiple personality disorder, which we'll, we can't even address, but this is everywhere. Yeah. We're estranged in some way from one another and uh, trying to seek attention and care in these ways that I would hypothesize do not really meet the underlying need for connection, belonging, and meaning. And that brings us right back to that wonderful grounding in Jung that 
often the presenting sy- symptom is a cover right. for yes. the deeper right. need, right. the neurotic compensation. Mm-hmm. Our friend uh, James Hollis, a Jungian scholar and author, you know, always says, what it's about is not what it's about. Well, and it's also, again, to, to, to go back to something we talk about often, it's also an example of neurotic suffering, right? Mm-hmm. which is the substitute for the real suffering. So the neurotic suffering would be the, the symptoms. And then what's underneath? And there is something underneath. We're, we're not, I am certainly not making the claim that there's not real suffering and need underneath this. It's just that we don't want to mistreat it. We don't want to treat it with antipsychotic medication or, or get too excited about the symptoms in front of us because then we just strengthen them when what's really needed is an investigation about what's underneath. And with that, it may be time for us to transition into looking at a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you. And it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. (laughs) That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be (laughs) missed. (laughs) It's having a life of its own, which is just what we want. And today's dream is from a woman who's 31. She's a musician. And here's the dream. It's nighttime, and I've traveled to France with my immediate family and also a woman I've known who has a lot of money involved in the fashion industry. We arrive at where we're supposed to stay for the night, a very rundown part of town. We come to a pink house with bars on the windows. My company, used to five-star accommodations, hesitatingly agrees to stay at these dodgy houses. The next scene, I'm in a twin bed with my brother asleep in the twin bed next to mine. I know my parents are asleep in the room next to ours. All the lights are out and it's dark. A darkly figured shadow man enters the room, an intruder. I'm at once frightened and also intrigued. I gasp, and he notices I'm there and turns to leave. As he leaves, I ask, who are you? He turns for a moment from the door, and I feel his gaze. I'm overcome by a sense of longing for him, and he leaves. My father enters the room moments later and tells me he saw him too. And for context, our dreamer says, My father was unfaithful to my mother for 20 years before his infidelity was revealed. They are still together. I'm struggling to maintain long-term relationships with my male partners. Before going to sleep, I had meditated and asked the dream maker to show my images of what was at the root of my unsuccessful relationships. 
She says the main feelings in the dream were both fear and attraction. Well, the thing I just want to say from the top, and kudos to her, the pivotal kind of Percival moment is mm. that she asks, who are you? Yeah. yeah. Like that is the triumph because we have these scary dreams and our knee-jerk reaction often is to attack or to run, or but, but not to engage. And the dreamer rallies and she finds her curiosity in the middle of what could be a scary symbolic yeah. encounter. So the fear turns into this wonderful kind of animus longing that has a lot of promise. I mean, this wait for act two of the play, but uh, I'm impressed that the person has done enough work that she could catch glimpse of this and orient to it with the right attitude. Well, and it, it also speaks to even what she reports in the context that she went to bed asking Mm -hmm. So yes. she was really receptive to this encounter. Mm -hmm. I wish I had context for the woman that she was traveling with. I think that that would mm -hmm. tell us something, something about that feels important. All we know is she has a lot of money in the fashion industry, but well, m maybe there is something I can do with that. I'm thinking about the difference between the five-star accommodations and having a lot of money in this glamorous profession and then being yes. in, in kind of in squalor. Because I imagine that may mirror in some way what her family life looked like, that it looked perfect, and then to find out that really there was this infidelity going on for a long time. Yeah. I'm, I was thinking as, along similar lines around how the dream starts out with a lot of persona, and that that may have been the case in her family of origin uh, that it was covered up and it looked, the family looked nice. France is associated with fashion and elegance and great wine, a, a real aesthetic. And she's with a company that stays in really great five star places. And here she is in this sort of dodgy, rundown part of town, at which point the dream scene shifts to being in a twin bed with her brother next to her in another twin bed and the darkly figured shadow man entering the room. So underneath the persona, there really is shadow and the shadow has life in it. And there's a clue, I think, also in the dream about some of her own struggle to maintain relationships with the male partners in as much as there are three different dynamics that are dancing in the bedroom. I mean, there's the dream ego. She has the archetype of the brother who's asleep, but right next to her, the archetype of the lover, the animus, the dark lover, and then the archetype of the father. And so I think if all of that is a bit of a carousel moving around in her relationships, that can be very stressful and very difficult to know what you want from a partner, but also the paradigm that you're dancing in. I would imagine that the dream could signal the beginning of a separation process where the lover is not the father and the lover is not the, the brother. Yes, that's just what I'm thinking is a process of differentiation because the shadow man enters and uh, the dream ego it is overcome by longing as well as fear. And then her father enters the room. And so the father archetype interrupts what might have continued to transpire with this shadow figure entering the room. So I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction because what I notice is the father says, I saw him too. So that's like a little bit of a left handshake between the father and the daughter, that they both are in relationship to the same dark secret. And this is something that I have seen with women who had fathers who were, uh, who, who constantly cheated where there was a lot of infidelity. There's a real wound to the young woman's psyche when her father has been unfaithful to the mother. And it's surprisingly one of the ways that it manifests is the daughter consciously feels very wounded and very angry 
and often very judgmental of the father, but she may have trouble being faithful in her relationships too. So I see the dark shadow man as this kind of incredibly exciting and seductive, but but dark, perhaps desire mm-hmm. to do something shadowy, like to um, to be unfaithful herself, or or a little bit of an unconscious recognition that she may always feel a compulsion to stray, because she's in this identity. She's in a sort of shadow identity with her father. They've both shared the same vision. And so what I think you're uh, headed toward, Lisa, very astutely, is the idea of the lover as the exciting object, the very attractive, very exciting, uh, alluring object infused with some some fear, some trepidation, but a lot of excitement, and that is inherently unstable. And she references that in her comments about not having the ability to have long-term relationships. There's something exciting about males, but unstable. And the antidote to that might be the brother <laughs> who who is asleep, but that would be a different kind of relationship with the male, right? A little bit more fraternal rather than the sort of exciting, dark, um, illicit, but, but something, something a little bit more um, companioning. Companioning and also very stable. Your brother is your brother. It's a structural uh, solidity of relationship, regardless of what the character of the brother is. Right. But 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 it, there it is, just as a given. Right. Lovers choose each other. Siblings just are born into it, and that's <laughs> yes. the end of it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of promise there at the end, and and work mm-hmm. to be done. I think that there's a sense that the laboratory elements have been set. And now it's time to get to work with these various ingredients and to see what she can do to to free some things up. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.